Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. Uh, before we begin, can I ask one of you to please uh, lead us in prayer, please? Ibrahim, Teti, can you lead us in prayer, please? Yes, Please, let's pray. Thank you, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to listen to the word once again. Father, we pray that our hearts and minds are open to receive your word. Father, we also ask the grace to be doers of your word and not hear it. Father, we pray as we hear your word today, Father, will be transformed so that we can fulfill our purpose as five in the scripture. Father, thank you for the opportunity once again. Just in your prayer. Amen. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Abraham. Okay, today we'll continue looking at uh, chapter 12, okay? So uh, we looked at chapter 12, just um, verses 1 and 2 on, uh, on Wednesday. We'll continue with chapter 12. Uh, just as a quick recap, uh, so Paul is telling uh, and writing these chapters uh, from 12 onwards, talking again about Christian living, uh, which is where he stopped at chapter 8. And then uh, chapters 9, 10, 11, he takes a small kind of a detour. Uh, he goes on a small vacation. And then he comes back to talking about Christian living in chapter 12. And then he says, you know, in keeping in mind, you know, uh, all that... Uh, he has written so far to them, he's told them, keeping in mind the goodness of God uh, and all that Paul has explained thus far, talking about justification from the guilt and penalty of sin, uh, uh, you know, the adoption uh, in Jesus Christ, our identification in Christ, that we are no longer under law but under grace, um, then just uh, uh, reassuring us that the you know the Holy Spirit is with us, in us, uh, and living within us, uh, the promise of help in all of uh, afflictions, in all uh, troubles and difficulties. Uh, the assurance of our standing in God's election, uh, the confidence of our coming uh, glory, the hope that we have, uh, confidence that nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, uh, confidence about um, you know, God's continued faithfulness. Uh, so he says, in the light of all of these mercies that is in the past, present, and future, uh, so Paul is, you know, uh, requesting them, begging them, pleading with them, you know, uh, to present their bodies as a, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which he says is their reasonable uh, service or which is their, uh, you know, logical uh, uh, or, uh, you know, in uh, intelligent worship uh, to God. Okay, and then he also says, you know, this is something else that he wants them to do. Uh, uh, first thing is to present their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And he also says in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good acceptable and perfect will of God. So we were basically talking about what is... Um, what is the meaning of, uh, uh, you know, the renewing of our mind? And we say we said that the best way to explain, uh, you know, the renewing of uh, mind is, uh, you know, by looking at uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 7 to 9. That's the best way to explain renewing of the mind. A renewing of the mind is when uh, we, you know, uh, lay down uh, our ways of thinking, our way of doing things, our thoughts, and taking on the ways and the thoughts of God, uh, which is much higher than our ways and our uh, thoughts. And he says that by renewing of our minds, you know, it leads basically to the transformation of our lives. Uh, and he talks, uh, the word transformation is the Greek word metamorpho, which is uh, which we get the English word metamorphosis, uh, which we saw is a complete transformation from a worm that is just wriggling on the ground, a caterpillar that is uh, transformed into a beautiful, uh, colorful uh, butterfly. So he says, you know, uh, 
by the renewing of our mind, this transformation of our lives, and we are able to live, think, and behave differently. That means we are able to um, uh, live, think, uh, you know, the ways and the thoughts of uh, God. Okay, and uh, we ended by saying we look at practically how we can, um, you know, live a. a uh, you know, live our lives uh, as as if to say we have renewed minds, or how do we know that we have renewed minds, or uh, how does a renewed mind actually operate? So, just to choose an example, Paul mentions in the last verse in this chapter, in chapter twelve, uh, Paul says, "Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good." Okay, uh, so the way of the world is when you do something bad to me, then I will do, uh, you know, I will return that bad to you. Okay, maybe not in the same way, maybe twice as bad as what you have done uh, to me, so that you will learn a lesson. Okay, or, you know, if you do something evil to me, I will do twice as much as evil than what you have done to me. So just imagine if everybody in this world is operating on this level. You know, you do evil to me, I do twice as much. Okay. So you do twice as much, and the person returns back four times. Okay. And then it keeps multiplying. So you just see how it keeps evil keeps growing in the world. And that's why, if you look at the world, you know, uh, why is there so much of evil? You know, it's because all of us are, you know, trying to give back to that person, or do back to that person twice as much as they have done uh, to us. So because everyone is reaping others for twice as much as evil they have received. That's why we see that so much of evil in this uh, world. But God says, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So a renewed mind is saying, uh, and uh, yeah, that's what Jesus says, you know, if you're hungry, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If he has no clothes, you clothe him. So that is how a renewed mind operates. Okay, uh, a wicked man who lives in this wicked world, he, how does he operate in his mind? You did something evil to me, I do twice as back to you. But, you know, a person who has a renewed mind, how does he live in this fallen world, in this wicked world, instead of repaying twice as much as the person has said evil to them, you know, if they, they love their enemy, they do good to them, uh, they help them out, they care uh, for them, okay? Uh, but we know that, you know, this does not come as a natural response, uh, you know, feeding our enemy, you know, giving them uh, something to drink when they're thirsty, clothing them. Um, but, you know, when we have a renewed mind, that is a mind that is constantly chewing on God's word. Remember we said the caterpillar? It keeps eating and eating and eating and eating uh, because it knows it's going into that uh, mold where it's going to be met metamorphosized into a butterfly. Uh, the same way we need to keep uh, chewing God's word. So the word chewing in the Bible is we need to be meditating on God's word. The more we meditate on God's word, uh, God's word fills our hearts, our minds, our wills, our emotions, and we see ourselves automatically uh, you know, uh, living uh, as God has asked us to in His in His Word, and we look at ourselves being transformed in the way of living and thinking, and we don't overcome evil with evil, but we overcome evil with good. Okay. So Paul mentions that the renewing of our mind not only brings about transformation, but we will also be able to prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of uh, God. So he says when we renew our mind, uh, we can prove, uh, we can test, uh, we can uh, determine through our testing what is God's uh, good, pleasing, and perfect will. Like in the laboratory, you know, when they do tests for the samples they receive, they come up with certain conclusions, right? Okay, this blood sample, this urine sample, uh, this is what is wrong, this is what is not right in the body. So they come up with the, uh, with the conclusions, okay? So when our mind is renewed, the same way we can come to conclusions, we can prove, we can test, we will know what is the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of uh, God. So he says the renewing of our mind not only brings transformation, but also determines the will of 
uh, God. So how can we know the will of God? We know the will of God to a renewed mind. And uh, he uses three adjectives here, good, acceptable, and perfect will. Now, some people say that these are three categories of God's will. Uh, well, that's not right. You already learned this in your uh, first year uh, when you studied Fulfilling God's Purpose for Your Life and also in that book, uh, Receiving God's Guidance. Uh, we mentioned there that there are no three categories of God's will. Uh, God's will is just good, pleasing, and perfect. These are just three adjectives uh, that are used here. Okay, So a renewed mind to the very thoughts are able to say which is the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of uh, God. Just as a cross reference, let's read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, please. Uh, can somebody read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17? Ephesians 5 17. Anyone can read that, please? It says in Ephesians chapter 5, okay, read Siddhant. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of God is. Uh, thank you. So it says, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So can you understand what the will of the Lord is? Can you understand what the will of the Lord is? Yes or no? Come on, can you understand what the will of the Lord is? Yes, we can, but I can understand. Yes, you can understand the will yes, of the Lord. Yes, we can. Yes, you can understand what the will of the Lord is because it says here, okay, you can understand what the will of the Lord is. So connecting it to Romans chapter 12, uh, we can prove the good, acceptable and the perfect will of God. Okay, now the struggle with some believers is, you know, they ask them, they ask uh, this question, should I use my mind, okay, or should I just totally, you know, depend on the leading of the Holy spirit so there are two uh, sides of the coin okay two kinds of believers one set of believers say you know we shouldn't use our minds uh, our uh, you know our logical reasoning our thinking our understanding uh, is all sinful uh, because our soul is not yet uh, you know, transformed. It's only our spirit that is born again. Our soul is not born again. So we shouldn't use our mind. We should just only be led by the Holy uh, Spirit. And such people, you know, kind of, uh, kind of end up messed up because you know they sometimes are listening to their own emotions, uh, their own, uh, their, uh, their mind sometimes, and they think it's the Holy Spirit that is actually uh, leading them. On the other hand, there are people who purely go by reasoning and by logic. So even if some God tells them something that they have to totally depend on faith, they don't receive it. They don't accept it. Because why? Their logical reasoning, their minds are not attesting to that. Okay? How can it happen? Uh, I don't think it can happen this way. Uh, what if it does not happen? Uh, so, you know, it doesn't fit my logical reasoning, my thinking. So I don't think it's going to happen like this. So that's the other extreme. Okay, they don't depend on the inner leading of the Holy Spirit. They purely go by their logical reasoning and understanding. But as believers, we need to learn to blend both. Okay, yes, God uses our mind. He's given us our mental faculties. I already explained this to us you know, when, when God said he created us in his image and likeness. It's basically that he gave us a mind. Why did he give us a mind? So that we can understand the mind of God. He gave us a will so that we can do, you know, uh, um, what he wills and also, you know, make our own uh, uh, choose according to our will. So, you know, uh, God created us in his image. He gave us a mental uh, faculties. We need to be intelligent people. Uh, we need to use our mind. Uh, we need to use our renewed mind, which is a mind thinking according to the ways and thoughts of God. And at the same time, we need to also depend on the leading of the 
Holy Spirit, which means we need to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, the inner prompting of the Holy Spirit, the inner voice and the audible voice of the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, you know, the renewed mind and what the Holy Spirit are saying will go in agreement. They will be in total agreement. So, you know, uh, what the Holy Spirit is saying and what your renewed mind is saying will be in agreement um, uh, because why our renewed mind has been trained uh, to, uh, to be aligned, to, to think in the ways and thoughts of God. So when the Holy Spirit is revealing to us the ways and thoughts of God, we automatically are able to discern, agree, go along with it because our mind is also, our renewed mind is also affirming to us, it is also in agreement um, uh, with it. So the Holy Spirit, you know, gives us, um, uh, affirms uh, to us, to the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, uh, through this inner audible voice, um, or uh, through the inner voice of the Holy Spirit, you know, he, he attests to us, he tells us what is the good, pleasing, and the acceptable will of God. So we need to walk with the two, okay? And this is a great confirmation. You know, when your mind, your renewed mind, uh, and, you know, what the Holy Spirit is saying, the leading of the Holy Spirit, when they're walking together, you know, there's a great confirmation. Uh, because, you know, you're using your renewed mind, which is able to understand the will of God, what the will of the Lord is. And also you have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, uh, because the Holy Spirit is attesting, saying, yes, uh, this is the right thing. Go for it. Do it. Say it. Okay. So it's not wrong to use our mind because God has given us our, our mind and he wants us to use our mind. Uh, but we need to to come to a place where we are having a renewed mind and not a carnal mind, okay? We need to come to that place where we are thinking with a renewed mind uh, and, uh, you know, listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying in our hearts and these two will go in perfect agreement. So thinking and listening. Thinking with a renewed mind and listening in our hearts what the Holy Spirit is depositing in our spirit. Okay, we need to do these two things, thinking and listening. Thinking with our renewed minds, listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying in our heart. And these two are in agreement with each other. There is perfect unity and harmony. Uh, it will be like, you know, those two uh, railway track. You know, when there's two railway tracks, uh, the train goes very, very smoothly right? If uh, one track is going straight and one track goes uh, left or right, then you know what happens, right? The train can get derailed, it will be an accident and many lives will be destroyed. So our mind, our renewed mind, thinking and listening should be those two tracks that are going simultaneously together. Uh, then there's perfect unity and harmony. And then, you know, we can journey smoothly on the road or the plans and the purposes that God has planned for us. Okay. Verse 3, Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, For I say to the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Okay. Uh, so Paul is saying, through the grace given me. So Paul knew the grace God has given to him. He knew that he had the grace to be a leader. He knew he, God had given him the grace to be an apostle. And hence he could tell the church that through this grace that is given to me, I'm telling you or I'm beseeching you, you know, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice or be to, to be transformed, the renewing of your mind. And in other letters or other epistles that he writes, he beseeches them, he tells them what to do and what not to do. So also you and I must know the grace that God has given each one of us. Okay, why is it important for us to know the grace that God has given to us so that we can operate in that grace? And when we operate in that grace, we can operate with confidence. Okay. And he says, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. So Paul is saying, you know, uh, you know, all of you be level-headed in what you think about yourself. 
Okay, how can we apply this uh, for those of us who are in ministry? Uh, just let you like to give us an example. You know, when our ministry go grows and people are either joining our Bible study group or they're joining the church that we have planted, uh, we tend to think that all of this is happening because of me. You know, or you started a ministry among youth or children or uh, you know uh, among you know whatever group of people. Everything seems to be going well. God is moving mightily. Suddenly we begin to think, you know, all this is happening because of me. You know, we think, hey, I'm a gifted person. Um, I'm gifted by God. I'm greatly anointed by God. Uh, and when we think like this, you know, our whole view of ourselves gets inflated. Okay, and when we do that, we are not thinking of ourselves soberly. Okay, uh, but we need to start thinking based on um, an unreal estimation of ourselves. So this is the first step, you know, towards fall. What is the first step towards our downfall is when we think about ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Okay, and not when we don't think of ourselves more. Or soberly. So Paul is telling us all the time, think soberly, be level-headed, keep your feet on the ground. Yes, Elisha? Yes, madam, thank you. Um, is it right for a believer to pray that in light of what Paul is teaching, that we should think soberly of ourselves and even uh, think well of others even more than ourselves is it right for a believer to pray that uh, god blesses him more than his his brothers his siblings his family members his friends his colleagues is it right for a christian to pray such a prayer uh thank you for your question elisha so uh, yes, it's important for us uh, to pray that, you know, we can, uh, God give a humble spirit, a, a humble heart attitude. Um, also, we can pray, God help me not think uh, more highly of myself than I ought to think. Help me to think of myself more soberly. Um, uh, like, you know, it's given in various places in the Bible, put others first, Paul himself writes, you know, put others first first. Uh, uh, before you uh, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to put others before you um, you know to live peaceably with all uh, uh, with all people uh, so you can pray that yes it's an important prayer to make uh, can we pray God bless me more than my uh, my family or my siblings or people in my church uh, well that is a most selfish prayer to pray but we can pray, God, uh, you know, fill me uh, with more of your anointing, which is not a selfish prayer. God, just fill me with more of your anointing. Every day we can say, God, more of your anointing. Today I need a fresh anointing from you. Uh, God, I want to... Uh, move mightily in the uh, in the gifts of the spirit. I want to exhibit all the nine gifts of the spirit. I want to manifest the fruits of the spirit, which is a prayer that we can make. But all of this, we need to know, does not come automatically. See, uh, uh, Jesus says, if you abide in the vine, you will bear fruit. Okay, so the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit is an automatic thing that happens is an overflow of our intimacy with god uh, as a, a relationship with god we really don't need to ask because the more intimate we are with god the more time we're spending with god this is an outflow because what we uh, we do in secret you know god rewards us openly Okay, that's what the word of God says. What we do in secret, God rewards us openly. So uh, how does God reward us openly is we uh, are manif we manifest ourselves as being more blessed people. How do we manifest ourselves as being more blessed people is, uh, you know, when we're flowing in the gifts of the spirit, um, uh, there's great uh, uh, anointing and power that is released to us. We see people's lives touched, people's lives transformed, people's uh, uh, lives being healed. Uh, um, uh, and also people will see the blessing of God on us. So yes, you know, um, when we are, when 
we are born again, we identify with Christ. Uh, we are already in a right standing with God, right standing in His grace. We are already received every spiritual blessing uh, and physical blessing. But for that spiritual blessing and for that physical blessing to be manifested in our lives, uh, you know, we need to walk in obedience to God's word, in alignment to his word, alignment to what the Holy Spirit is telling us, uh, that is when, uh, you know, blessings just automatically flow into our uh, lives. Uh, and there's no need for us to ask God to really bless us because he's already blessed us. You know, every spiritual blessings, Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2 talks about, you know, we are already blessed in the spiritual realms. We've received every spiritual uh, blessing. We need to appropriate that in our lives. And how does that become a reality in our lives is the more we walk with God in our intimacy, in our walk with God, the more we are obeying God, living our lives in alignment to his will, plan and purposes, the blessings just automatically flows. See, we really don't need to ask that. Did that help, Elisha? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, praying a prayer saying, uh, you know, bless me more than my uh, people around us is a selfish prayer. I think we should all ask God to bless all of us, you know, that all of us are being blessed by the, by the Lord equally. And of course, he's not a God who's partial. He blesses everyone equally. Okay. So we'll continue with verse 3. Um, and Paul says, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So God has given all of us already uh, a measure of faith. We have all started out with that measure of faith that God has given to us, which means, you know, we needed that measure of faith even to trust God with our salvation. Okay. But we need to keep growing in that level of Faith. We can't stay with yesterday's faith level or the previous season's faith level or you know the uh, the pre a few months back the faith level that we have been in. We keep growing in the faith that God has given to us, and we need to uh, you know. And this faith keeps growing when our, our ways are uh, according to God's ways. Our thinking is aligned uh, to uh, God's thinking, to God's thoughts, um, and we also need to think aligned to. Uh, you know, the measure of faith or the faith that God is uh, giving to us or putting our faith and trust in uh, God. And so Paul says, stay uh, level-headed. Don't get inflated how you think about yourself. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to verses uh, 4 to 8. Yes, Christopher. Oh, yes, Pastor. Thank you. I... Um... I can't remember the verse, but there was a there was a verse in the Bible which says that God um, gives us more, or um, He um, makes us do more, do do much more when our faith is, you know, depending on our faith, something something yes. to that that effect. I I don't think it's this verse, but uh, there's another verse. So I just wanted to ask you whether you know you remember the cross reference to that and how that how does it that how does this relate to what you just mentioned i'm not able to uh think about that verse now but i can only thing that comes to my mind is uh he can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask think or imagine according to the power that uh is at work in us uh so yes you know the the power that is in work is in us. Power is linked to the anointing, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, the measure that we are in fellowship and uh, with the Holy Spirit, connected to the Holy Spirit, with this word, um, uh, God can do, you know, exceeding abundantly more than we can ask, think or imagine according to the power that is at work in us. I think that is that uh, verse that is coming to my mind. I'm not sure about this uh, faith uh so yes but you know if you have uh, the more you grow in your anointing that anointing comes through your relationship with uh, the the holy spirit with god your intimacy with god uh, reading god's word you know that's when you can do exceeding abundantly more and also when you are uh, intimate with god uh, your uh, faith 
also grows. And when your faith also grows, uh, you can see this greater release of anointing and power and greater manifestation of the work of God uh, through your life. Did that help, Christopher? Maybe we can look at uh, that verse, and then we can get back on that. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to verses 4 and to 8. On verses 4 to 8, Paul is talking about the functioning of the body. Uh, you know, these verses are very familiar, so we'll just look at it. You know, it says we have uh, different body parts. In verses 4 to 8, he says, For as we are many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If it's prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Our ministry, let us use it in ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerful. Yes. So basically, Paul is saying that, you know, uh, you know, just like the different parts of our body have different functions, but each one of them, you know, in their different functions work uh, in their own functions for the total functioning uh, and the whole well-being of the body. The same way, you know, all of us, even though we are individual people, individual members, uh, we are all part of the body of Christ. Okay, there's one body of Christ where all individual uh, members, we all have different functions. Okay, uh, that means God has given us each of us specific functions in the body of Christ, and each of us have different gifts according to the grace that has been given to us. And the grace and the, the gifts and the grace that God has given to us is to fulfill the function that He has given to us in the body of Christ. Christ. So I want to just highlight on these three words, functions, gifts, and grace. So in the body of Christ, each and every member have functions, have gifts, and grace. So what is function? Function is what we do or we serve in the body of Christ. So you can be an apostle, prophet, teacher, somebody who's an encourager, somebody who's an administrator, somebody who's helping, somebody who's serving, uh, whatever. So that is your uh, worship leader, children's uh, minister, youth minister, that is your function. Now gifts, the capabilities, the talents God has given to us. So what are our gifts? Is our, our talents, our capabilities that God has given to us. And the grace. Grace is the empowering, God's empowering, His power upon our lives to exercise the gifts and fulfill the functions. Okay, so what is a grace? Grace is the empowering upon our lives to exercise the gifts and fulfill the functions. So God has given us a, a function or, you know, it can be one function or many functions and the gifts and the grace to fulfill that particular function. Okay, so we can develop the gifts and grow in the grace. We need to develop our gifts. Uh, we need to grow in the grace of God, which means how we function can get better and better as we continue to develop our gifts, our talents, and grow in the grace that God has given to us. Okay, James chapter 4 verse 6 says, there's more grace that is available uh, to us. So the gifts can develop we need to develop on our gifts uh it can get better it can get much more sharper uh we can uh, you know get more uh, skilled in the gifts that god has given to us now in these verses he mentions seven functions these are not uh you know only the seven functions that happens the church it's not the exhaustive list it's just a few of them and the seven functions he mentions is prophecy uh, you know, serve, which is, means ministry, teaching, encouraging, which is exhortation, giving, leading, and showing mercy. And these are all the lists of the membership gifts, okay? Uh, these are different from the spiritual gifts, okay? And these are different from the gifts of the Spirit. Now, gifts of the Spirit are given to everyone, okay? Uh, membership gifts are given 
for each one for the function of the the body of Christ the spiritual gifts is the Holy Spirit giving specific gifts to specific people apostles prophets teachers um, and uh, ministers okay so we see that uh, these are these are uh, membership gifts um, and they are, these are different from the spiritual gifts or the gifts of the spirit uh, and this membership gifts is just uh, you know a man-made title it's not a god-given um, title okay so paul says whatever is your function in the body of christ you know fulfill your function do your function use them this means that uh, these are the capabilities God has put in your lives, uh, the gifts he has given you to fulfill a specific function. So if your gift is singing uh, and or playing a musical instrument, then what is your function in the body of Christ? Come on, what is your function in the body of Christ? If your gift is singing and your gift is playing an instrument, what is your function in the body of Christ? Yeah, worship ministry, right? Sorry, yes, somebody was saying something. It's worship ministry. Uh, if you're very good with uh, young people, uh, so what do you think is your function? You relate very well to young people. You can speak to them. You can motivate them, encourage them. Youth ministry right so uh, if you are very gifted uh, teacher uh, so what do you think can be your function in the church in the body of christ teaching ministry you can take on leadership of doing a bible study having a life group also preaching and teaching in church or you are powerful prayer intercessor prayer warrior you can you know your function in the church is being uh, is spread Okay, if you're somebody who's uh, very active, running around, you know, serving people, helping people, what is your uh, role in the uh, function in the body of Christ? Administrator, greeting team, meeting team, serving team, you know, all of those uh, uh, things. Okay, so Paul is saying, whatever is your function in the body of Christ, use them. Uh, that means the gifts, the capabilities that God has given it to us is to fulfill your function. And each one of us have been given different membership gifts, which means different functions in the body of Christ. These membership uh, gifts are related to the function uh, we have in the body. And there is the grace of God uh, that empowers us uh, to exercise the gift to fulfill the uh, function. Okay. So, um, you know, we must encourage believers, you know, to discover their gifts so that they know their function in the body of Christ and they can carry out their function in the body of Christ. Why should we encourage uh, people to know and discover their gifts? Because if we have more people ministering, functioning in the church, there are more laborers who are actively engaged uh, in fulfilling the function of the body in the body of Christ, you know, in the body of Christ, uh, to the body of Christ, for the body of Christ, we see that the you know the the church becomes more healthy, more strong, uh, and uh, you know everybody is going to be edified and built up. So hence, in our local church, uh, we need to let every believer uh, you know know what is their gifting, uh, know what is their calling, so that they can flow into the functions. They can function in one or more uh, gifts that God has given to them, and they can. Uh, you know, uh, they can edify and build up the body of Christ. The body of Christ can be strengthened and be built up. So every believer has been given the grace from God to serve in a particular function. Okay. So in chapter 12, Paul begins by telling us, you know, present your bodies. And then he goes on to say, renew your mind. And then he goes on to say, serve in the body of Christ. Okay. Uh, basically, he starts uh, by saying, you know, um, I want to make you the solemn request. Okay, remember that in verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. He's making the solemn request. So what is in solemn request? The first thing is to present their bodies as a living sacrifice. The second one, he says, is to be renewed by the transforming of their minds. And the third thing he's saying, the solemn request is, he's saying, you know, serve in the body of Christ. Okay. 
verse 9, he says, let love be without... Uh, okay, uh, anyone has any questions before we move on? Verses 1 to 8, anyone has any questions? No questions? Okay. Now, verses uh, 9 um, following, uh, you know, Paul focuses uh, more on our relationship with others in the body of Christ, what we need to do in our relationship with others, uh, especially in the body of Christ and also with uh, those who are outside the body of Christ. So he's talking more about practical Christian uh, living that's focusing on our relationship with people in the church and people outside the body of Christ. Okay, so verse 9, can somebody read verse 9? Verse 9. Verse 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. So Paul is basically saying, don't pretend to love. You know, be genuine in your love to others. Uh, you know, your heart, your love must be heartfelt. Uh, you know, when you care for others, help others, be genuine in what you are doing. Okay. Verse 10. Can somebody read verse 10, please? Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Okay. Verse 10 says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in order giving preference to one and other. So here it says, you know, give preference to other people. You know, don't always think about yourself. I, me, myself, I must be given this position. I must be given the seat of honor. When and I go for this meeting, I must be called. Uh, I must be referred to so-and-so with, uh, you know, with honor and respect, uh, you know. Uh, sometimes when we are in ministry and when God uses us greatly, you know, we feel a sense of entitlement. We feel we are entitled to uh, some things. We feel that we need to be given preference over others. For example, you know, if there are three preachers uh, in your city, you know, or in your church and there is, uh, you know, somebody calls you uh, to preach, uh, you know, you feel that you should be given the first preference, you know, uh, you should be called to preach. It's not that the uh, other subordinate uh, or the other associate minister should be called. You are the senior pastor, you should be called, or you are the senior most pastor in the city, or you are somebody who is a you know great man of God, a woman of God, mightily flowing in the anointing of God. Hence, you must be given the preference first. Only if you say no, they should ask others you know there are some people when you don't give them that preference you don't give them that son they get very very angry and they get very very upset you know so here what paul is saying you know in honor give preference means give chance to others allow others you know allow allow your associate ministers uh to preach to teach give them the prime time you know sometimes the senior pastor takes the uh, the 9.30 service, 10.30 service, he gives the evening service to the associate ministers because many of them don't come to the evening service church or he gives them early morning, 7 o'clock, because very few people come. Uh, but here he says, in honor, give preference to others. You know, choose others above yourself. Verse 11, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. He says, you know, fervent means be on fire, full of fire, serve God at all times with zeal and passion, not lacking your zeal. You know, sometimes we run out of steam, uh, we run out of zeal and passion, uh, you know, but uh, Paul tells Timothy, you know, fan into flames the, uh, the fire that once burned in you, the passion that once burned in you. So we always need to keep that flame burning. And how do we keep that flame burning? Always, you know, in our intimacy with God, uh, reading God's word, uh, you know, spending time uh, praying uh, and also, you know, um, uh, communing with the Holy Spirit. Verse 12 says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, continue steadfastly in prayer. 
Okay, this is something that uh, uh, needs no explanation. You know, we all go through difficulties and hardships, but we need to endure. Okay, that's why Paul says, continue running your race with perseverance, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter. Because if we fix our eyes on things of the world, people of the world, the mountains, our hindrances, uh, our storms, you know, we will not endure, but, you know, we need to endure even though we are going through hardships and we need to be consistent in our prayer life. Verse 13 says, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. So, you know, we need to bless others. We need to give to the needs of others. Uh, we need to be generous and kind. At the same time, you know, sometimes people in ministry, pastors in ministry think, you know, they become God. You know, we don't become God. We cannot uh, deal with every people's, every person's problems. We cannot meet every person's need. There are some people's need we can meet. There are some people's need we cannot. When we cannot, we just, you know, sh uh, you know, uh, show them other people, other ministries who can help them, other counselors, other things, other places that they can reach out for help. So don't think that you're God. You have to take care of every need of uh, people in your life group, in your Bible study group, in your team, uh, in your church. No, don't become God cannot be God, we cannot meet everybody's needs, uh, we cannot please everybody, we cannot bless everybody. What we can do, we can do, uh, you know, be generous and kind. At the same time, things that we cannot do, you know, we lead people to put them onto other people who can help them, who can minister to uh, them, okay? Verse 14 says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, basically means don't retaliate. You know, no, don't repay evil for evil, even when people persecute you, uh, talk back behind you, gossip, you know, you just bless them, uh, leave them to, uh, to God to judge, to take care of them. You just continue uh, doing the work of the Lord. Don't uh, divert your attention, your time and energy because it's not going to help you. It's not going to help anyone. Uh, it's it can also cause a division. Just focus on your calling and what God has called you to do. Leave these people to God. God will take care of them. Verse fifteen says, "Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep," which means you know basically get into the lives of people, be part of the lives of people. When they're rejoicing, rejoice with them. When they're mourning, you know weep with them, be with them. Verse sixteen it says, "Be of the same mind towards one another." Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Okay, We need to be willing to associate with people at different levels, intellectual people, you know, associate with them, uh, be with them, speak in their level, speak to, uh, uh, that makes things that make sense to them. When you are, you know, don't uh, feel shy to relate with people who are humble, the simple folks, uh, you know, uh, the poor, uh, those who are not financially sound, you know, be willing to relate with them, speak into their lives, minister to them. Uh, as God's people, we need to learn to relate people uh, at all levels, engage with people at all levels, uh, minister to people at all levels, and speak into people's lives uh, at all levels. Verse 17 says, repay no one evil for evil, uh, have regard for good things in the sight of all men so you know he says have regard for good things in the sight of all men he says uh, you know we must be careful to do things that are good uh, in the sight of all people uh, you know whether they're believers non-believers um, uh, you know relate to all of them in the same level be the same person you are uh, to whether you're with believers or non-believers because when people look at us they must see uh, what we are doing is good uh, and no one should point an accusing finger at us. We must be blameless in the sight of those in the church and those outside the church in whatever we do and the way we do things, we should be beyond reproach. Okay, just a few more verses uh, before the end of this chapter. He says, uh, if it's possible as much as it uh, depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now, live, try your best to live peaceably. Why he says, if it is possible, and why is he saying, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Maybe sometimes we want to live peaceably, but there are people who want to fight with us. 
quarrel with us. You know, uh, they just want to extend the strife. They don't want to give up. They just want to keep on arguing. Now, we cannot control another person's behavior, but we can choose uh, to be uh, peaceful with people. Okay, verse 19 and 20 says, Don't avenge yourself, but rather give place to the wrath of God. For it's written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And then he quotes... Um, in verse 20, he's quoting Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him, him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. So when people do harm uh, to us or evil to us, don't judge them. That's not our work. It's God's work. Vengeance is his. Uh, God is going to decide on the judgment. God is going to decide what is going to happen to that person instead we need to focus on what god has called us to do what has god called us to do bless them be nice to them you know don't repay them uh, evil uh, and also you know live peacefully or peacefully with all men okay and then the last verse was 21 do not overcome do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good Okay, we already, I have already mentioned about this verse. So verses 9 onwards, what he's mentioning is all practical. Uh, you know, he, why is he mentioning all this? Because he's saying that, you know, a renewed mind, when we renew our mind, when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, um, so even as we serve, uh, you know, the body of Christ, using our gifts and grace uh, for the function God has given to us, we can do all of these things in the way we are supposed to be doing. You know, we can walk in this attitude. We can walk in this mindset because our minds are basically uh, renewed. Our minds are renewed. We are, we are walking. We are living in the ways of God. We're thinking in the thoughts of God. And also because we are presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, you know, we can be able to do all of this. We can walk in this attitude, in this mindset, because we are living with a renewed mind and because we are presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. So the two main important thing is you know, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, laying, crucifying the desires of our flesh, sacrificing the sexual appetites, the uh, you know our own selfish desires, everything, crucifying it daily, presenting our bodies, um, as a living sacrifice, also renewing our minds. When we do that, you know, we can automatically uh, uh, live the ways uh, God, God wants us to live and we can take on the thoughts of God. We can live the higher ways and the thoughts of, okay? So, um, okay, Kennedy says, you know, what is the meaning of heaping burning coal uh, what is the uh, implication is because you know when your when your enemy is doing evil towards you and uh, you return them back with doing good being nice to them it's like uh, basically it's like you know um, uh, you know heaping burning coal on them it's like you know they are um, you know inside them they are burning you know, uh, burning in a sense of, hey, you know, I did so much of evil for this person and this person is being uh, so good to me. Or, you know, how can this person, you know, be so good to me? Why can't I be like this uh, person? So there's basically a burning inside of, uh, it can be a burning of jealousy, hatred, anger. It can also be a burning of, oh my gosh, you know, uh, I did so much of evil to this person and I'm feeling so guilty. You know, you the burning sensation that happens basically when you get angry, uh, when you are jealous, uh, uh, when there's pride, uh, you know, and that is why there's an increase of acidity and uh, gastric and all of those persons because of stress and all of that. Uh, and also because, you know, hey, I did so much of evil and look at this person. How can I be like that person? Why can't I be like that person? Why am I not like that person? So that that deep down that uh, that that burning inside you so it's basically heaping burning coals of fire on his uh, head you get hot in your head you know we get red hot with anger or we get red hot with frustration <laughs> it's uh, it's like that you know so when you get red hot with anger your uh, you know uh, your face gets red hot or when you get red hot with frustration 
the face just shows it, your mind gets heated up, it's burning coals of fire on his head. Good question, Kennedy. Yeah. Anyone has any questions? Sorry, we're already five minutes past our time. Okay. There's no questions, then uh, we'll end class. Okay. Thank you all so much uh, for patiently waiting five minutes ahead of time. Have a blessed weekend and um, God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.